Good afternoon. I'm Earl Butch Graves Jr., President and CEO of Black Enterprise. And it is my privilege to welcome you to our first ever Black Enterprise Corporate Board C-Suite Summit. A vital component of our diversity, equity, and inclusion events series. As part of our coverage of corporate America over the past decade, there has been no issue more critical than the expansion of Black representation at the highest levels, the boardroom and the C-suite. Why should this matter to you? The senior leadership of the nation's largest corporations make strategic decisions on the internal and external direction of the company, including its equity agenda. The acuity of that focus determines the elevation of Black talent, inclusion of Black vendors within the supply chain, marketing spend with Black media, and allocation of dollars to Black organizations, communities, and causes. As for the role of corporate boards, these governing bodies hold a fiduciary responsibility to safeguard the financial health of major companies and maximize shareholder value. Moreover, their oversight of the CEO and senior management team determines where the corporate practices align with core values, impacting employees, managers, suppliers, customers, investors, and other stakeholders. As the number one black digital media brand, we continue our ongoing development of the exclusive black enterprise registry of corporate directors and most powerful executives in corporate America rosters, along with corresponding reports on the status of black professionals as a celebration of black corporate leadership. But we also use the report to place a much needed spotlight on thousands of companies that refuse to embrace black representation within corporate governance and the upper echelons of management. I am proud, however, that our data and analysis have been used by scores of organizations, ranging from the Executive Leadership Council to the Congressional Black Caucus to address the institutional barriers that block black corporate advancement opportunities, as well as promote significant change like the racial composition of corporate boards at a number of S&P 500 tech and finance companies in recent years. Due to the current demands for greater corporate equity and reversal of racial disparities, we have realized substantial progress. In fact, our 2021 boardroom power report featuring our registry of corporate directors reveal that roughly 80% of S&P 500 corporations today have at least one black board member versus only 63% in 2019. But overall change in black corporate leadership for the most part remains too slow, tepid and inconsistent. I need only to review the statistics to confirm that assertion. Black executives occupy only 3.2% of the senior leadership roles at the nation's largest companies and less than 1% hold chief executive positions. That's why we present today's corporate board C-suite summit. The pledges made by corporate America over the past year was not the end but the beginning of a re-energized effort to eliminate systemic racism and economic inequity. We all realize claims of commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion ring hollow with the noticeable absence of black executives or directors engaged in the leadership, governance, and direction of major corporations. To achieve our objective, we have assembled some of the nation's most renowned corporate leaders to offer insight and guidance. Before we start our program, I would like to take this time to extend my sincere appreciation to our sponsors, AT&T and Nationwide for making an investment in this unique virtual summit. Now we will hear a special message from our friends at Nationwide. 
Please welcome Christy Martin Rodriguez, Vice President of the Nationwide Retirement Institute. Hello, I'm Christy Martin Rodriguez, Senior Vice President of the Nationwide Retirement Institute. On behalf of Nationwide Associates across the country, welcome and thank you for attending the first Corporate Board plus C-Suite Summit. Black Enterprise has been a long-standing valued partner of Nationwide for many years. We want to thank Butch Graves, the Graves family, and the entire Black Enterprise team for hosting the Corporate Boards plus C-Suite Summit and creating a forum in which they can provide relevant information for Black business professionals and entrepreneurs across the country. Nearly 100 years ago, Nationwide was founded by a small group of entrepreneurs with a unique and noble purpose to put the needs of customers first. This mindset was the cornerstone of our On Your Side promise. Most people know Nationwide as a top auto and homeowners insurance company in the industry. But how many of you know that Nationwide is a leading provider for retirement planning solutions for individuals and business owners just like you? As a mutual insurance and financial services company, we're able to take a long-term view, which allows Nationwide to serve the communities where our members live and work and lean into our mission of protecting people, businesses, and futures with extraordinary care. We're also proud of our track record as a company for our long-standing commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. At Nationwide, that commitment starts at the top of the house and flows throughout our culture. One way we're bringing this to life is through the Financial Alliance for Racial Equity, or FAIR. We invited several industry partners and historically black colleges and universities to join us in an effort to attract a more diverse students and professionals into the financial services industry and create pathways for career development and their advancement for long-term growth. We believe that attracting more diversity to the financial services industry will not only make us stronger, it will help us address the racial wealth gap by positioning the industry to better address the needs of underserved communities. We are honored to amplify Black Enterprise's mission to advocate for Black representation at the highest level. And we're excited about the first Corporate Board plus C-Suite Summit and its mission to provide insights and information on how to expand those opportunities for Black leadership to help transform corporations, increase shareholder value, and advance opportunities for all. Before I go, remember, Nationwide is on your side. Thank you and enjoy the summit. Thanks, Christy. For roughly a generation, corporate America has experienced what I characterize as a major black brain drain when it comes to leadership of the nation's largest publicly traded companies. This situation is not due to a shortage of commanding, strategic and innovative minds who are able to navigate successfully and profitably lead one of these iconic companies. The reason is simple, institutionalized, racism. Since 1987, when Cliff Wharton became CEO of then TIAA CREF, the first black executive to helm one of the nation's largest publicly traded companies, there have been only 31 black CEOs to ascend to that echelon, and only four of them have been black women. Sadly, in 2021, you can count the number of black chief executives among the S&P 500 with one hand, which is less than we had 10, 20, and even 30 years ago. Before the pandemic and the aftermath of, George, of the George Floyd murder that triggered a multitude of corporate commitments to address racial inequities within and outside the workplace, black enterprise could only identify 300 of the most senior black executives at either the largest public 
or private companies. In our recent research, we have found the percentage of black board members among the S&P 500 companies have improved considerably. The push for black board representation has resulted in real progress over the past two years. In 2019, Black Enterprise found that 37% of the S&P 500 companies did not have a single black board member versus roughly 20% of those same companies today. However, among the S&P 500 with black corporate directors, only 10 of them hold the lead director position. Despite the promise of corporate renewal, there still remains a drought of black corporate leadership at the highest level. So as we stand at this inflection point, the best way to, attempt to start our corporate C-suite summit is attacking this issue head on. And I can think of no better corporate veteran in which to hold this fireside chat conversation than Ronald A. Williams, the retired chairman and CEO of health insurance giant Aetna. One of the few blacks to serve as the chief executive of one of the nation's largest publicly traded companies, Ron also represented one of our generation's most brilliant global business leaders. He transformed Aetna into one of the most successful and admired corporations in the healthcare sector during his tenure, increasing its market cap from 4.7 billion in 2001 to 15.3 billion in 2011, the year he retired. His current board service includes Boeing, Johnson & Johnson and American Express, serving as their lead director for one of the corporate America's most diverse boards with five black corporate directors on its 15 member governing body. Focusing on private equity, corporate governance, values-based leadership and transformational change, he advises C-suite executives through his firm, RW2 Enterprises and guides professionals and entrepreneurs with his best-selling book, Learning to Lead, the journey to leading yourself, leading others, and leading an organization. Now he joins me to discuss how we can purposely and permanently change the face of corporate leadership going forward. Ron, welcome. Thank you oh, thank for joining you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Ron, you know, uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of things to unpack and... Uh, but I, I thought I would be remiss if I didn't mention that uh, uh, you were very close to my father, Earl Graves Sr., um, during his time here on, on this earth. But um, and he he really truly loved you as a both as a person and as a uh, as a leader, uh, which he was most impressed with as a leader in corporate America. And we're going to look at a few different things, both the C-suite as well as boards of directors, but would love to get your point of view, especially as it learns to, as it relates to your book, Learning to Lead. I think that's such a perfect example of things, but tell me a little bit about your background so people understand that, you know, you didn't wake up on third base one day and you were suddenly thrust into becoming the CEO of Aetna. Tell us a little bit about your journey and, and how you got to ascended ultimately becoming a CEO and that and, and the learning to lead process that ultimately got you there? Well, look, like many people in the audience, well, when I was young, I, I didn't even know there was a game, let, let alone be on third base. <laughs> I grew up in, uh, in Chicago. It was a highly segregated city. I didn't know anyone who had uh, been to college the only professionals I came into were teachers at school. There were very few black teachers. I went to a school that was started out white and then in Chicago, you saw this whole migration and, and urban flight. And I remember when I graduated, not one person talked to me about going to college. And whereas all of the counselors spent time with other students planning their academics. I was very fortunate because my family always placed a very strong emphasis on education and they placed a strong emphasis on the ability to not settle, to really set high standards, set high goals and pursue it. And one of the things that I always explain to young people 
is never let other people define for you who you are and what you can do. And I talk about this as reframing because we all grow up with a script in our head that says, you're a woman, you can't do this. You're black, you can't do that. And it really is important to set extremely high goals, get to that horizon and don't stop. Look for the next horizon and get there. And I think as, as, as a young person, I went to a community college for two years. And then from the community college, I went to a four year school. And then from four years, I went into business. And I always comment that the year I graduated from college was the year that your father started Black Enterprise Magazine. And it really opened my eyes to a world of opportunity I did not know anything about. And so for me, it was extremely important starting point for my career and evolution. Outstanding, you know. Um, when you get out of college and you once got into your first job, you said it, it was it coincided in 1970 with when Black Enterprise was founded. What did you see as your options going forward? In other words, you know, as a you're a young college graduate now coming out, no one had given you any direction up to that point on even being able to go to a four-year college or what have you, but now you were suddenly thrust into what's next. What did you see in your horizon or your initial horizon right then? Well, for me, I think one of the things that I saw was that there were industries that were growing very fast and the computer industry was one of those. And I ultimately found my way into a computer company. And the one thing that I believed was I should focus on those opportunities where results were indisputable. So I went into sales and I was enormously successful. And that made it extremely hard for people to deny my talent, my capability and my results. And so for me, one of the most important things I explain to people is what I call the sector call. <laughs> You don't want to be working in the buggy whip company. You right. want to be working in the company that has growth potential and where the macro environment means that there is enormous growth and potential because there's a greater need for people and particularly a greater need for people who can produce results and have a demonstrated track record. And so for me, that was really, really important. I went from sales, I went into marketing, I had a very successful career there. And then I decided it was time to go back to graduate school. And that's another chapter. Okay. And after graduate school, tell us a little bit about how you got ultimately to Aetna and that career journey. Well, I went to graduate school. I went to, uh, I decided if I was going to go to graduate school and take time off, I needed to make certain it was worth it. So I applied to um, Stanford and MIT. And I was admitted to both based on the recommendations because I was much more at that point an exec, a person who had been working in corporate America and had a good track record. I picked MIT because I felt it was going to be the most rigorous and it turned out to be. And from there, when I finished, I got uh, involved in a lot of entrepreneurial activity and I met some people who were developing a healthcare business in California. I signed on as a founder. I moved to California. And we created a healthcare company that we built and then ultimately sold. And when we sold it, I looked for something to do. And I said, well, now that I've been in healthcare a little bit, I understand it a little bit. Another important sector call, healthcare was 10% of the GDP then. It's now almost 20. And so I joined what became Blue Cross of California. I was there almost uh, 14 years, became president but it was clear I was never going to be president of that company for a variety of reasons. And so I left. And I think this is an important lesson for people is often they don't let their legitimate aspirations drive their decisions. They, they settle and they accept. And I said to myself, what's the worst thing that happens if I leave? I've built a great track record. The next place doesn't work out. I'm sure something else will. And so I was turned out, I was recruited into Aetna. I came in pretty much as president and began the transformation of the industry. And that's when I met your father. All along the way, I built a record as an extraordinarily uh, effective executive 
who really led by what I call values-based high performance, treating people right, treating people with respect, with courtesy, but also keeping a very strong eye on the results and making certain that my, my teams created the right results the right way. So I want to stay in that, in that uh, journey and, and bring this back to the audience in regards to lessons learned and how, because as I, as I went through in the introduction, what has happened in the C-suite of corporate America has become very problematic, especially problematic for African-Americans. Something has happened, right? And we can, we can sit here and, and uh, conjure up all kinds of reasons we think something might have happened or come up with excuses and, and what have you. But at the end of the day, there are less black executives in the C-suite today in 2021 than there were 10 years ago, 20 years ago, even 30 years ago on some level. And we're trying to examine and figure out what's happening because that's gonna to lead to the next part of our conversation with dealing with boards. What has happened? It, is, it, it can't be, we haven't lost our desire to succeed, right? <laughs> uh, we're better educated, um, have had more opportunities from that perspective. But something has unwound along the way, and I think you touched on some of them, some of these things where you said, can't be afraid to leave, got to believe in yourself. <laughs> you know, you got to know what the next horizon is going to be. Can you take a stab at, you know, and, and let's, let's try to keep out the last two years of this, the, the pandemic of COVID-19, and we're going to come back to that for a second in the COVID, of, the pandemic of racism. But even pre that, so let's say it's call it 20, 2019 and going back. And, and you retired in 2011. What, what happened? You know, what, is, what, is, what has been the breakdown that corporate America has been able to get away with there being less people than there were before that look like us? Well, let me first say that I meet with African-American executives, Hispanic executives, women executives, white executives. Let me tell you, there is no shortage of black talent and absolutely no shortage of effective people who can run companies. What I see missing is really the whole concept of advocacy, sponsorship, and a conscious development program. In other words, very few people start out with the skills and capabilities to be the CEO. And what has to happen is companies have to figure out where the executive is today that has the potential to do that. And there might be one or two areas that they don't quite have, but could get. And the question is, what is the plan to help them get there? And if there isn't advocacy and sponsorship, but there is advocacy and sponsorship for others, you don't close that gap. And so I think one of the areas I would say has contributed to it is the fact that the whole focus on diversity became a much broader topic. That's good. That is a good thing. But when you aggregate, you also have to segment. And you have to say not just how are we doing broadly speaking on diversity with women, with African Americans, Asians, Hispanics, et cetera. You can't just say, oh, we're doing great in diversity. But when you look at the data, it turns out many companies were doing very well with women, hooray, that's great, but they weren't doing well with, with other communities. And so I think companies and boards lost the focus. And I think one of my beliefs is that any executive who was committed to building a really diverse workforce from the top down, that's reflective of the customers they serve, by and large has failed. Now, if that executive failed in hitting their earnings per share, failed in introduction of new products, failed in the introduction in other important compliance issues, that CEO would have been fired. But poor performance in this domain has been tolerated and accepted. And I think the good news is those days are over. Yeah, I mean, Ron, the, the, the whole diversity, the whole word diversity in and of itself, in my view, in my humble view, has become a diversion away from the word black. 
because when you create the diversity booyah base, you then take and throw white women in it, blacks, Latinos, Latinx, Asians, gay and lesbian, veterans, what have you. So you can make your diversity numbers look marvelous, depending upon how you want to, what you want to count, what you want to throw into it. And I think it's incumbent upon those people who are in corporate America who are in a position, because there's a dual responsibility here. There's a responsibility, yes, for a board or a C-suite to say, we're looking for a diverse slate of people that we're going to be moving forward in this organization and with a purposeful you know, intent on doing that and using the word specifically black. Right. Right? As you say, as you disaggregate these numbers, that's when you get to see, you say, well, wait a minute now, of our diverse thing that was 38%, 90% of that was white women. So we're still down. We don't really have as diverse a slate as we thought we did. But there's also, and I, and I, and I wanna to touch on that too, there's also a responsibility for black executives who were sitting in these some of these C-suite positions. They too bear a responsibility. I, I, there's a requirement to say, I'm gonna make sure that I'm not the last person to walk through this door in this position, but that I open this door and let and push 10, 20 others to do so. When we think about this, this group, and I'm now I'm talking about the black executives group, what do you think is driving perhaps their fear <laughs> of wanting to open that door and make sure that the next Ron Williams comes through it? You know, I, I talk to a lot of executives in those circumstances, and I think they fall into different categories. And I would say the best that I've seen simply say, I'm going to hire the best executives I can find, and I've looked, and three of them are Black. And judge me by the results we produce. Don't judge me by the color of their skin. Right. I've seen other, I talked to one executive who was a CEO, fairly new in a smaller company, had happened to be a woman who was black, had hired a new executive who was black, and the company was in an uproar. Did it mean that all of the white males were going to be out? Now, this was in a group of other CEOs, white, Asian, everybody. And I said, I want to pause for a minute. And I wanted to ask how many of the other CEOs have ever spent a minute pondering over the fact that you're white and you just hired a white executive? <laughs> and not a one of them <laughs> said anything. They all said, I wouldn't spend two seconds on it. And so I think to some degree, people have to have the confidence in their judgment, the confidence, their ability to communicate and most importantly, the confidence to speak plainly to the organization in plain English. Now, I have an expression that loss of privilege can feel like discrimination. And the example I use is there was a point at which, let's say, to be a police officer, you had to be five foot ten. And if you were five foot ten or above and you had a pretty clean record, you could go down, you could apply and you stood a pretty good chance of getting that job. Now, the minute they said, you don't have to be 5'10", you don't have to be a male, you have to compete against women, you've got to compete against people of smaller stature, maybe you're Black, maybe you're Hispanic, maybe you're Asian, you're Filipino, whatever. All of a sudden, people who had that advantage don't have it anymore. And so when they don't get the job, the answer you get back is, I'm not the right demographic. That's not the answer. The answer is you had an unfair competitive advantage unrelated to the skills and attributes necessary to do the job. Now the arena is truly open to people who can do the job and they're going to be judged on the criteria of the job. So I think it comes down to executives really have to have the confidence to be able to hire the people that they think are the best people and I can tell you because of the struggles, the challenges that many black executives go through, they are really good executives. You know, I, I have a, a, a quote I use that I, I uh, 
many executives, when you sit in a room, are always certain and occasionally right. And I can tell you, if you're in that room and you're black, you're worried about being always certain and, and always right. Right. Yeah, that's it. That's the that's a great analogy, Ron, because I, I think about that. You know, in a corporate in a, in a corporate setting, there seems to be no problem in corporate America with taking chances or they call them stretches. <laughs> and we stretch for the white guy. Because we think, you know, he can get there. Right, we're going to stretch to see whether he can get there or not. And we almost never want to stretch for a person of color. Right? It's that person has to come in, has to have the kind of track record you had, which is effectively unblemished. You know, when Edna brought you in, <laughs> there wasn't a whole lot they could say, like, well, he does, he's pretty good, but he doesn't quite have this. You know, they there's always this whole conversation of fit that we, we, we'll get to boards in a second that boards talk about when they talk about, well, that wasn't quite the right fit. But when you turn the tables a little bit and use the analogy you just did, it's, it really is, it's revealing, right? It's a little bit like, I, I, I use this example, I was saying to some folks the other day, I was out uh, going to play golf and I went to the country club to go play golf. Went there with my group of guys that I oftentimes play with and, uh, White guy came up to me and he said, you know, Butch, when I see you here, almost every time I see you here, I see you playing with black guys. Why, you know, why is that? So I let him finish the sentence. I said, well, you know, it's interesting you should say that I said, because every time I see you here, you're only playing with white guys. And I often wonder, why is that? And he was taken aback because he was like, well, in other words, that was the norm in his mind. <laughs> and what I was doing by dare playing with three black guys was outside the a comfort zone, right? And so he was uncomfortable and didn't know how quite to deal with it. Let me, let me, let me pivot a little bit, Ron, if I could, to what we've been experiencing these past 18 months, which is going to then lead to the board discussion. But... You know, we we have we face something that no one could ever possibly have imagined, right? The, the pandemic of COVID-19. But I say to people, there were twin pandemics taking place at the same time. The pandemic of COVID-19 is, you know, acknowledged. We are dealing with it. Uh, we have we're, we're, we've a vaccine has been created that has begun to. To, to, to work and work away. And ultimately, this too shall pass, right? In a short period of time that, in a shorter period of time than anyone could possibly imagine, but it shall pass. And you already have seen the results of that. But at the same time, we had this pandemic, I, I call it referred to as the pandemic of racism. And it's not new. It's been around for 400 years. The difference is, is that social media brought it to light in a way that it had not been brought before. And suddenly we could not deny the overt racism that we were experiencing and seeing, highlighted by the knee on the neck of George Floyd for nine minutes and 29 seconds. But that experience caused corporate America to, to pause <laughs> and to have to reflect. And just would like to get your insight on what you think happened at that time and is happening now that's different in corporate America because it feels different, right? I, I, I see it in my interaction with CEOs and corporate executives and boards all the time now. There's, there's this reluctant acknowledgement that it's there, not quite know, sure how, what to do with it. Um, but you know, in both your role as having been as a CEO in a corporate, as in, in, in a publicly traded company, and now even in your role in having to advise people as, you know, as a consultant, I'm sure people, phone been ringing off the hook, Ron, I need your help desperately. I need your help desperately. <laughs> but that's a lot I've, I've tried to throw at you, but I'd love to get your point of view on, hey, what did we see in these last 18 months? How has corporate America responded? 
And what is different this time than the previous transgression that might have taken place five years ago or 10 years ago? Well, there's several points. I would say that that the George Floyd event culminated in every black executive and black person getting a second job. <laughs> and that second job was really trying to articulate that experience and what they have been experiencing in the context of the environment that they operate in. And I can't tell you the number of executives that I've talked to who have had to talk to the CEO and to this group and to that group, because companies have realized that they were not really in touch with the impact of their decisions on the black community at large and particularly of the employees that are there. Now, you know, I'm a bit of an optimist and I believe that most people are not racist. You know, you always have some lunatic fringe, but I think most people are not. What they don't understand is that the implications of their actions can have impact on people that clearly have negative impact on black Americans. And black and negative impact on other low income people as well, not just Blacks, Hispanics, and others. But I'll give you an example that's what companies are doing and with what I think the difference is. Companies are thinking much more deeply about their processes and practices that have the unintended impact of inadvertently discriminating or eliminating from a competition Blacks, Hispanics, and others. I'll give you a few examples. The talent management example you gave of not the right fit, or they're too aggressive, or they don't lead the way I think they ought to lead, is an example where attributes that are really unrelated to the job can eliminate people from the competition very early in careers. Careers in companies are made much earlier than the C-suite. They're made when you don't get the plum assignment. They're made when you don't sit in, in the back of the room and take notes and see what the presidents do and the vice presidents and the senior executives. They're made at that stage. And when companies don't have a rigorous process and somebody who's sitting in that room who says, what do you mean they're not a good fit? How much time have you spent with them? Give me an example. I can't tell you the number of times I get back the example was, well, somebody who worked for me, who had somebody who was on a team she was on, <laughs> said, and you say, that is no basis for talent evaluation, mm -hmm. period. The other thing I would say is if you look at some of the benefits companies have, the employee compensation, the employee reimbursement for, for, for tuition. Who do you think can afford to pay their tuition and get reimbursed later? It's not the moderately compensated employee. It's the person who has a college degree, who's being well paid, who can afford to pay the tuition. So the company says, gee, we got this great program. But unfortunately, when you look at who's actually able to participate, one whole category. The other thing I see a lot of is when I talk to executives who've been in companies five years or so. They've applied for jobs endlessly. They never get a plain English answer about why they didn't get the job. And what you find particularly in the older companies is people have relationships that go back 20, 30 years with people who are colleagues and coworkers. When a plum job opens up, they've already called somebody and that job is wired. <laughs> You're applying for something that doesn't exist. Right. And when you ask, what do I need to hit the mark and be qualified? You never get a, a, an answer. One of the things that you have to do at, at the top of the house and where these senior executives who are black can do is say, no more deals. There's a job posted. I want to see the criteria. That criteria has to be related to the content of the job. It has to be not based on the way you did it, but what it really takes to produce results. So those are just kind of a few examples of companies backing up, taking a good look at where are they recruiting? If they're only recruiting 
in certain communities, they're not going to get the candidates to even apply because they are not aware of the ad. So companies, I think, are being much more systemic. And I think this is where we'll talk about boards really looking much deeper in X-raying what's going on in the company. So let's make that pivot to boards, Ron, because I think that this is something that uh, you have a very unique perspective on. Uh, And in many ways, I would consider you to be today's dean of African-American board directors in that you have served on boards of directors for a number of years. You've been the chairman of the board. You're now a lead or have been a lead director for a number of years as well. And you sit on, you know, some of the largest corporate boards in this country. I gave a a statistic in, in the introduction which was an interesting one because, you know, when we started doing this board list 10 years ago, um, almost 10 years ago, when we did their first list and all we did, by the way, all Black Enterprise did is take public information and make it more public, right? This was information that was available to the public because these are all publicly traded companies. And we just brought to bear and said, when the first time we did it, well, It's interesting, these are the largest, this is the 500 largest corporations. And of those at that time, less than 230 of them had black, it was less than 50% had a black director on the board. This was less than 10 years ago. It started to rise. And when we brought attention, the the other thing that, that we did is I said, okay, we're not only going to talk about the companies that have black directors, we're also going to do a list of the companies that don't have black directors. So we're going to call you out. We're going to, and all we're doing is taking the public information and say, hey, you're in business, what have you. And this was not even five, six years ago. You named the large corporation, especially in the tech industry. None of them had black door directors. Fast forward, it's gotten better, right? And in 2019, when we looked at the list, it was, you know, it was still not where it should have been. It, it's of the 500 you know, we had um, 170 of them that did not have black board members even at that time. But now it's risen up to, in 2021, to now at 400 of the 500. Not, it's not perfect by any stretch of imagination, but 400 of the 500 now have a black director. But by the way, as we watch that and lead that and we measure that, every one of those companies have a white woman on the board. There is not a S&P 500 company that does not have a white woman on the board, right? And that goes back a few years. So while there's been progress, our progress, of course, always stalled behind white women. And now we are, we are here. But the process of getting on a board and then the responsibility, so there's two separate, it's a two-part question. I'm gonna deal with the process first. What's the real deal? What's the, because people think, oh, you know, I'm done well enough, I'm qualified, I'm the right age, and I'm going to contact it, a headhunter and have them submit my name <laughs> to join a board. There's no lack, there's a million people that do that. Absolutely. So what's the real process that people have to go through to join and become a board member of an S&P 500 company? Or, I mean, those are the largest of them, but it could even be a smaller one. A couple of things I would say, and, and, and one of the things that gets overlooked, uh, and this is a place where, uh, you know, I think one of my colleagues, Ken Chenault, did a fabulous job. Uh, Ken always made it a point to make certain that his executives were able to serve on boards. Many companies simply don't let their senior executives serve on boards. <laughs> and so what that means is that the talent pool is diminished among those individuals who are in fact the most qualified and who in fact would benefit the most to help them close that gap between where they are and the C-suite being the CEO by having that board experience. So one of the starting points is for CEOs to really think deeply about their own policies and for boards and nominating and governance committees to think about board readiness and board placement as part of the executive development experience. That would be one thing. 
because I can tell you, you stand a much better chance when your CEO calls up another CEO and says, we have an executive with this skill set. We'd like to be on a board. That is magic in terms of cutting through that. The other thing I think is really developing the understanding of what is board governance. And there are lots of organizations, the National Association of Corporate Directors, and lots of the universities have programs. To, to be board ready, it helps to understand the difference between management and the board. And that is quite addressable. There are lots of programs to help people do that. The reality is the old boys club was, the name comes up, they look around the room, does anybody know so-and-so? The answer is no. They go in the reject pile. Name comes up. You know, I know them, but I don't think they'd be a good fit. There's that good fit reared its head again, goes in the reject pile. So what you really have to do is you have to build, develop your skills and competencies, and you have to have advocates who will speak for you as being board ready and board capable. The people who are on the board of the company that you serve on are really good, can be good advocates for you in regard to that. Uh, developing this, this, this capability and then thinking about other what I'll call starter sets, for example. Uh, one of the big things we're doing in pri my private equity activity is we have increased through a lot of hard work and moving the firm along many more minorities serving on our private equity portfolio companies. These are really great experiences because it's about the business and less about the corporate governance and the SEC and all the big company boards. But it can be a great experience as a way for people to get started. The other thing I think that's helpful, how I learned, I served on the YMCA board in Los Angeles. It was a board composed almost exclusively of senior business executives. And I learned a lot about chairing a meeting, how you preside, what you do. And they needed somebody to chair the technology committee. And I volunteered <laughs> and got my first actual committee chairing experience there. So when it was time to go to a board, I had people who were executives who had seen me in action and who would become my advocates in some ways, sponsors for that. Uh, I think the uh, work that the Executive Leadership Council is doing and others is really, really important. And, and I encourage people to participate in that as well. Yeah, that's, that's great advice, Ron. And I, I think, um, you know, I need to make sure that people, more folks in my generation and the people in the generation behind me focused on that because they all wanna wake up tomorrow and say, well, I wanna be in the board of Apple, okay? Well, that, that sounds wonderful, but that's not how it works. It doesn't work. You decide, I think I'm qualified for that. And getting some experience on smaller boards, nonprofit boards. And frankly, in a lot of these nonprofit boards, there's some very, very extraordinarily powerful people who are sitting on these nonprofit boards who get a chance to see you and get to know you. Because I, I've been sitting on the board now of AutoZone for 19 years. And I've never once yet seen a recommendation come in specifically just from a headhunting firm that says, hey, I would like to recommend someone to you. That's not, never how the process works. It is someone is retired or someone has left the board. There's an opening. They ask the board members, do you all know anybody? <laughs> oh, yes, I do. You recommend someone that goes to the nominating corporate governance committee and they go through things. So the process is kind of this, I hate to call it this old board network, it's still in place. The difference is, is that if you're inside, if you happen to be a person of color, you have to advocate. You know, this is one of my, I call it my earlisms. My father would say to me, when I first joined the board, he said, uh, he looked at me in the eyes and said, no, please understand why you're on this board. And I said, well, okay, what's that? He said, they did not run out of smart white people to put on this board, but. And I heard that same, I heard that same speech. <laughs> and you probably heard him say the same thing. I, I heard it. Of smart white people said, you're, they put your black behind on the board and your job is to advocate on behalf of black people, black businesses, black things, and keep it front and center in people's face. And he's 100% right, right? Because that is, 
It's not that I don't have a producer responsibility to the bottom line and other things I do, but we really, really have got to make sure that when they do put you on the board, you've done that. And I want to, I want to make a, po a point to acknowledge this, Ron, because it's the first time in history of corporate America that we've seen this. American Express now has five African Americans sitting on its board out of 15. That is unheard of. It's never happened before. And the lead director, which happens to be you, is African American. Just give us a little bit of insight as to how that came about. Because some of these folks were, were added, because the other thing people are like, oh, well, you know, Ken Chenault was the, was the CEO. I said, yes, when Ken was there, there were black board members. But quite honestly, there were more black board members added since Ken retired. And he put the right person in place, obviously, so that that person would, would you know, follow the, the path that he has chosen. But share with everyone, because it, it is a moment of pride, it should be a moment, of, a moment of pride for American Express and for what you guys have done there that makes it uniquely different. And while by the, well, at the same time, as, as a shareholder, proud shareholder, I'll be able to say, American Express at an all time high, right? So it's not, the, the two are not mutually exclusive. Like, oh, if I get black board members, oh, I can't, I can't, be, <laughs> can't be successful. <laughs> you know? well, look, the, <laughs> We set out to do two things. One was to recruit world-class board members. And two, we wanted a highly diverse candidate pool. And we would not settle for a candidate pool that did not include black executives, black men, black women. And what we found as we went through the process was we found all these talented people and we just had the conversation when we looked at people who were coming and people who were going that we said, you know, why don't we, all this talent, it's gonna be someplace else or it's gonna be here. These are world-class executives, Charles Phillips, you know, in four. This, Charles has done more IT deals, transactions, has a better knowledge of te technology than, than, than any executive that, 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 that I've ever met. Uh, we've got Lisa Wardell. Lisa, you know, worked for Bob Johnson. I'd like to tell Bob he's insatiable and good at it. <laughs> okay. He's world class at it. And so we have uh, uh, Tom Baltimore uh, runs one of the largest ho hotel organizations. We have executives that any board would be thrilled to get. And I think one of the things that happens that companies don't think about is they're recruiting the board member but the board members deciding whether they want to be a part of that team because they got lots of choices today. And I think one of the things that attracted them to us was really the legacy of the company in terms of its strong commitment to diversity, to, to having a, a, a board that, that, that really thinks broadly about its social responsibilities, along with generating a very good profit for its shareholders. So I'm, I'm very pleased, I'm thrilled, it's reflective of our nominating and governance committee. And I think the, the people that, that, that Ken is chairman really selected to be on the board that were highly supportive of this process. So um, I'm thrilled with it. Yeah, no, kudos to you and kudos to Ken for creating an environment where we can see the best, the world-class directors who happen to be black and world-class results marrying each other and that it's a, it's a great demonstration of what can happen given the opportunity. Uh, I'm gonna give you, have an opportunity to say some last things, Ron, but I, I wanted to just touch on the pandemic of COVID-19 because we, we get asked by this a lot. You happen to sit on the board of Johnson & Johnson, um, one of the people who've created a vaccine for COVID-19. Uh, I'd like for you to give some words because they're, they, as you know, as you've certainly heard, and firsthand, there's a, there's a number of people, African-American, who believe, oh, no, 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 don't take the vaccine. They're, they're <laughs> there's a conspiracy theory there. Um, we shouldn't do it, what have you. And, and what's happened is I see it starting to hurt Black people in their ability to advance, their ability to be able to be accepted and other things. 
So love for you to, if you could share, since you have this background at J&J, &J, why the vaccine is so important, why it works, and why we as African-Americans should be stepping up to get this, to uh, take it. You know, one, I would say one, you know, every, I'm vaccinated, everyone I know is vaccinated. <laughs> and what we're concerned with are the people who aren't vaccinated. Now you have to understand that the virus wants to do two things. It wants to grow. And when it can't grow here, it goes to find someplace it can. And the people who are not vaccinated represent a hothouse for the virus. And they represent an opportunity for the virus to not just infect them, but to continue to evolve into a more deadly strain. So in a way, they actually are creating a high risk and high peril for the community, for themselves, their friends, their neighbors. Millions, hundreds of millions of people have taken this. And by and large, there have been very, very few incidents. And I would say all I can tell people is get vaccinated. It's not a plot. It's not this. If you believe in germ theory and you, let's put it like this, if it was a smallpox vaccine, would you say, no, I don't want to take it? Right. You know, this, this will kill you. This will harm you. And, and, and it, it can affect your life long term. It's not either. You, you have it, you get over it, or, or you have it and you die. There's all types of gradations of impact on your quality of your life, your mobility, your ability to uh, function. So all I can say is it's, it is an extremely important thing to get vaccinated. It's not a plot. It's not a joke. This thing will kill you. Thank you. Lastly, Ron, I want to I, I want to use one of my, again, of my father's earlisms and then attack it back to your your book, Learning to Lead. And um, it's been an it's outstanding book. I've had an opportunity to read it myself. Love the, the, the really common sense approach to what learning to lead means. But my father used to say to, to me all the time, he said, you know, what's the only type of black folks you need to be around are those that are willing to walk in harm's way, right? That stand for something and are willing to walk in harm's way. And I'd like you to try to, in your sort of closing uh, statement or remarks here, talk about willing to walk in harm's way and how you attribute that and, and to tie it back into your learning to lead in the, in the book that you've published, which is outstanding. Well, I would, I would say that one, I, I learned an enormous amount from your father. Uh, he was always quick to pick up the phone. And one thing I, I, I learned from is always start at the top. You know, I, I, I know you, you, you got that lesson very early. I was also very fortunate to get to know Vernon Jordan, who served on the American Express Board. And so I felt like I was in the presence of giants and learned a lot. And I think one of the things that I learned was this notion that if, if something needs to be done, something needs to be said, and you're not going to do it, and you're not going to say it, then you're not doing your job. And as Vernon risked his life, as your father risked the family to start a business and to take positions that were controversial, that these were men who changed the course of human events. And I certainly don't want to care, co uh, compare myself to them, but I have learned an enormous amount from them. And I think one of the things that I value is the opportunity to give back and to help the next generation go beyond wherever I thought I might be able to go. And the book is really designed to do that. It says, don't let anybody put any constraints on you. You can do whatever you want to do. It's hard work, but you can learn to do it. Ron, thank you for your pearls of wisdom today and joining me for this fireside chat. Uh, we look forward to helping us all grow and see more and more African-Americans ascend into the C-suite, ascend into the CEO's position, which is down to a handful we are right now, as well as ascend and, and do well in the board positions as they do. So thanks again for joining us. Look forward to catching up with you soon and all the best to you and your family. Well, thank you. And I will tell you, there will be more CEOs. I can guarantee you that, more black CEOs. Thank you, appreciate it. Have a good day. Take care. Oh.